So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. I am Jordan Sloop from Kentech Marketing. Our topic today is solving for cloud and multi-cloud network complexity. Our host for today is Eric Wright, Chief Content Officer at GTM Delta. And our presenters are Ted Turner, Kentech Cloud Solutions Architect, and special guest, Hasham Malik, Product Manager at Alkira. So in today's webinar, Eric, Hasham, and Ted will discuss observability practices and methods for network cloud virtualization and application ops teams. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the Zoom chat or Q&A, and we will answer them throughout the presentation. So with that, Eric, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Jordan. And of course, thank you, Hasham and Ted, for joining today, and thank you to everybody for being on. This is great. We love live content, and it's actually it's so live that we're not only going here, but I'm streaming over my own uh, live uh, YouTube channel. So your questions are going to the whole world, which is kind of cool. If you have any questions, like Jordan mentioned, but just drop them in the chat uh, because we want to make sure that we're tuning the content and the conversation towards really, really important stuff that matters to you. Uh, we're actually really aiming to make this a discussion versus slideware. We really wanted to say, like, let's focus on on what the problem is, because we know as folks like yourselves who are are living this every day and you're seeing, you know, we have this multi-cloud discussion. We're constantly talking about multi-cloud. But it's funny, the more I talk to people about multi-cloud, it even can be simple as hybrid where I've got some on-premises presence and then I've got you know a, a single cloud or even just a single cloud and multiple regions. We treat multi-cloud like it has to be this incredibly complex Netflix-like single application that spans multiple clouds. No, no mas, right? That actually does not exist for most organizations. And in fact, one of the biggest problems we've got is that we tend to have this sort of Pareto's principle of 80-20, right? So 80% of our workloads are actually not pure cloud workloads. Find me somebody that says they were born in the cloud. I'll find you three VMware data centers that are hanging off of the back of that cloud. That's kind of the reality. And so I think this is a good time. Before we even begin to talk about the multi-cloud challenge, we really also get stuck on terms sometimes. We talk about observability. And there's too many sort of overused phrases that tend to enter the, the tech ecosystem, but observability is incredibly important. It's not just a label. It's not just a thing. It's a practice. And that's why I really want to really call it right away. Ted, I know you and I talked about this uh, at length at Tech Field Day. For folks as well, go to the Tech Field Day stream. You can see a lot of fantastic stuff when Kentick presented recently at, at Cloud Field Day. Uh, so Ted, let's talk about observability and the difference between it and monitoring, because we let's let's get that out of the way right now. <laughs> so if we go back in time, if you uh, just take an analogy like a car, in a car you have the most common things: uh, a speedometer, what your gas gauge at, and that gives you an ability to drive your vehicle and understand, you know, minute by minute what's going on in your car. But when something goes wrong, there's a lot more that your car is tracking and understanding. And so if you've got the ODB port underneath the dash, you can plug in, a mechanic can plug in and gather a ton more data, start understanding what timing looks like in the engine. Um, when you get into say the NASCAR view of the world, what does the pressure look like on a shock? What does the pressure look like per tire? Those are the types of information that you need to run your business at scale, more than just how fast are you going or do you need to fill your, your gas tank up? Asking the, the additional questions, how are things going? What does the temperature of the engine look like? What does the temperature of the shock look like? And as you're going into scale, maybe NASCAR level type metrics are what you need. Um, when you're in the you know, regular business day to day, month to month, maybe a, a, a dialed back set of questions. But the ability to ask questions of what's going on in your network, that's what we're looking for here at Kentic. And, and I love that. That really is the the premise because uh, I'm going to do this right. Premise versus premises. So a premise is that you can ask the system a question based on inputs that are that are present in the system. This is not simply like you said a sort of a a mark on a graph. It is really we're we're asking something that will have an answer other than yes or no, up or down, and, and that's a big thing. Now Hasham too, when we talk about this move towards observability. And I think 
we really get stuck on the word of observability and, and how we look at things, but it's not just how we look at it, it's how we operate, right? So what is the difference with an observability mindset and how we run our environment? Yeah, so I think in the start, you mentioned uh, we're too much stuck about the cloud and multi-cloud and the complexity there, right? Uh, that is a reality and that is the fundamental change, right? Um, the applications are moving towards cloud and by the nature, if uh, uh, application is for a uh, medium or large scale enterprise customer, um, the um, result is that you would end up in multi-cloud environment. And that is by nature, right? It goes back to the same analogy where um, customers only having traditional network, uh, they had uh, different vendors, either because of the multi-vendor strategy, they didn't want to stick to one vendor, or they just wanted to use best of the breed, right? Uh, for different layers in the data center uh, or at the edge, they have different vendors and different vendors for services, right? The same thinking uh, and strategy going in the applications, in the cloud, um, you want piece of uh, the best pie in uh, from each of the cloud where it doesn't matter where uh, it lives, right? So you end up with the distributed architecture of the applications. Uh, and each of these environments, they have different monitoring and visibility things, right? The uh, But for observability to uh, work, uh, like Ted explained, you need all that data and you need to uh, have a, a look at it collectively to understand what is going really going on, right? Um, and these siloed environments, because lack of observability and different uh, monitoring tools, right? It requires you to approach each environment differently as well, right? And and in case of issues, uh, if car breaks down, that you're not going to just look under the hood, right? You're gonna trace down everything. So, so imagine yourself uh, troubleshooting a network with multiple browsers opened, right? Or engaging different cloud and networking teams to troubleshoot a single issue, right? You need to have your your network should be um, simplified in a way that it gives you a single view of your whole environment of regardless of how many clouds you are in or how many regions you are in, right? Um, and once you have a single view of the network, you can have better monitoring, uh, you can have better visibility and observability as a result of it. Uh, and that, I think that just simply makes you listen to your network better. It's funny, the you actually just, just hit something. I don't know how I didn't think of it before. Like your 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 organization, your whole IT teams are effectively your browser, right? And the difference is, do you have ten tabs or 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 three tabs? Like we're never going to go down to one tab of, in effect in the teams because they have functionally different things they do on a day to day basis, right? When I think of day two operations for my network team, there are things that are non-core to the clouds that are network operations. But then there's also application teams that are going to do things that are development focused versus production. We've got these like split things that the single pane of glass, you know, we've we've beaten that one to death, thankfully, and, and accepted that there's no single pane of glass. However, we can reduce the places that we go to, you know, a common field of view. And I think that observability angle is this idea of a common field of view where you may see different things that matter to your team, but let's come to one place as sort of a source of the entry points from which we can go to, and then we can then see how each other observe 
that environment. It's sort of that that thing of the elephant, right? Where someone says like, you've got the people that are blindfolded and they're touching the elephant. One says, I feel a tree. You know, the other one says, I feel a hose. And the other one's like, I feel a fluffy tail. It's That's the observability problem that we're coming at it from different angles. And if we don't have a common place in which we can generate of our individual viewpoints, then we're not talking the same language. And that means then, you know, we're we're not going to get to a solution because we're doing translation with everything we do. And I think that's kind of like, that's the human side of it, which is the, the biggest thing, right? We talk about automation and that's, this will be pervasive in our discussion. Everybody wants to automate. Software is better at managing software. Totally agree. However, software needs human influence. We can eventually move towards automation, but even today, if you've got a Tesla and it's got FSD, full self-drive, guess what? It's not, you don't get in the car, it drives itself and you get out. At some point you turn it on for a while and then you take it off. And there are places where it may not work. And there are, we still need the human. Thank goodness. Cause I, I need a job, <laughs> but let's talk about the next stage, right? We pull in data. So it's analytics, it's observe. So take this data in and then what do we do with it, right? We have to generate insight. This is always this flow because data is one thing. I could, you know, there's no, no, what does it say? No, no lie. That's no greater lie than one backed by statistics. But if we take that data and then we do something with it, we make a decision. This is where we talk about moving to insights. And also the thing we find is that we're doing stuff in production that we didn't try and test. This whole idea that we're going to have a QA environment and everything's perfect in QA and we're going to do it right. And then we're going to go to production and it will act like production. And how many people have got that XKCD thing right from the OpenStack days that what well, it worked in dev stack or like, I don't understand, like it behaved differently in, in development. Well, of course, because there were different parameters, there were different heuristics. So then the decisions that come from it, the insights that we generate have to be different across environments. And so Hasham, you know, when we look at going to production and how it has to, but the systems of observability and insight have to behave differently. How do we generate an understanding of how it will behave in production without just like saying, all right, let's just push it out there and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. I think that's very uh, interesting question. Uh, I'm going to step back a little bit, right? Um, uh, I mean, we talked about having a simple view uh, and uh, simplification in the network and application architect uh, reducing the complexity of the network, right? Uh, but what commonly we have seen is um, in the cloud, the, the footprint, it grows uh, dramatically, right? It gets out of hand very quickly. So you need to have network insights uh, to understand first, uh, what is your layout, right? Uh, what are your resources deployed? How you have deployed it, right? And, and a, a byproduct uh, advantage of having those kind of insights, details, insights is uh, you identify a lot of things that, uh, you know, they shouldn't be there. Um, and that helps you simplify the network more. Um, you optimize on the cost perspective, because you find the resources that you don't need, uh, they are just lying there eating up uh, your bottom line. Right? For example, one of the common things that we see is um, uh, elastic IP addresses. Right? They many times a lot of IP addresses they are not associated with any resources, but they're there sitting there uh, just incurring costs. Right. So um, once you have the insight, right, and these advantages, uh, then you really understand your network, um, how your network uh, is laid out, you know, what is the map of the traffic, right, how one endpoint is communicating with the other. Right? Once you have that visibility into the network with the insights, right, um, then I think synthetics come into play a lot, right, um, because 
you are doing that testing and like she said that many times i mean it's a uh, kind of cultural thing or you really end up testing applications in productions or making the changes in applications and things happen right uh, the synthetics validate uh, your network path uh, even though if it's simple right uh, you need that visibility uh, there uh, because we have seen uh, changes in the network as small as to um, somebody adjusting the security group, right? Or making a small change in routing table, or even worse, somebody's just deleting the TGW accidentally, right? Um, things can go down really bad, right? So uh, synthetics, uh, it helps you um, identify the issue uh, and uh, or, or leads you to a way to narrow down to where the problem could be. Right. And and then again, your network from talking from the Alkira perspective, right? Your network needs to be agile enough to um, remedy those issues. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. The synthetics are, I that's the proactivity. Like, I think teams are getting smarter about this, that we're moving ahead. And actually, a good, uh, good question came up in the chat, too. Does uh, from, from Pete, uh, Kubernetes, uh, and containerized networks get really complicated. How does that affect how you look at observability? And I think that's actually why observability as a practice is so much more important in Kubernetes because it is so much more dynamic and it's no longer even just like TCP, like IP, traditional full IP v4 endpoints. You're actually seeing now layer four to layer seven connectivity and you're going to see the introduction of service, but you're going to see much more complexity and that dynamic changes. So if you're not doing something to kind of preventatively and proactively look for that stuff, then it's it's just going to go bad, right? And it's going to go bad by getting a call from the service desk, like, hey, we've got an application that's down. And if you're not looking in advance for that behavior, then, then that's a real problem. And it's funny, another thing that came up too, so we do use Kubernetes, whatever it is, even just IaaS workloads, and we span them all over. And someone says, hey, this is great. We're going to get a deal on database over here. And then we're going to get a deal on IaaS over here. Oh, wait a second. Our architecture just created a real problem. And, and I think the cost of architectural decisions and the cost of outages is huge. Now, Ted, I know you and I have looked in our own wallets for our own personal cloud problems, uh, you know, just, just run in lab environments. But I'd love to hear about the the cost of of design decisions when it comes to cloud and, and network. We had a customer, uh, they were shutting down a, a, a data center uh, in the center of the country, and they were migrating their applications out into the cloud. And part of what their application did was take some of the content and write it into a cloud storage bucket. So storage out there on the cloud provider. Um, as they moved their applications out of the data center into the cloud, they followed suit and did what they've always done. They wrote those log entries into the cloud. But when they did that, they didn't choose a path that used private IPs. They just used the path of least resistance and in the cloud path of least resistance to go back across the public internet. So their application was deployed as they expected, and it was writing these log events into the storage location in the cloud and was taking a public path. And so those costs mounted. They came, uh, came back, hey, Kentic, can we get some insight? What's driving our cost for the network? And we're, we, we, we looked and we said, well, you've got this thing that you own in the cloud talking to some other storage location that you own in the cloud, but you're using public IPs. One of the things that you could do is you could just use private routing in your cloud, and that should reduce costs. $150,000 of cost avoidance later, they were able to make those simple changes in their application configuration, in their cloud configuration, and save money. And so those are the types of things that'll, that'll start to pop out that you're not thinking of. This is what we did before in the data center. We want to do exactly the same thing in the cloud. But in the cloud, you have to look at what those pathways are, what those costs are that you incur. 
And I think that really goes to the the fact that observability crosses tabs, it crosses teams like that, because you have an application designer who may not have understood the impact of that decision. And then a network designer who's, you know, building the framework to let that live. And some person in, in cloud ops who's like, whoa, hang on, what's going on? I'm getting this really bizarre cloud bill. And they have to like try and figure out where it came from, who's the owner, look at all these tags. Like they're going through their view of the cloud to then come and yell at the other two teams to say, who's doing this? And that's why this like having observability and a, a centralized outbound route to the information and the insight is, is super important. But I think that even goes one step further. And finally, given the Kubernetes question, I'm going to pop up a question in the chat because we love polls. We just went through election day, so it's time to have some more polls since we're talking about polls. These polls will be counted right here on the spot. Uh, so let's talk about Kubernetes as, as a platform too. I'm actually curious uh, who in the audience here is using Kubernetes. So we'll, we'll drop that up as a poll in a moment. Uh, and this could be whether you're using it on premises. We're not really concerned necessarily about production versus dev versus whatever, just who's dabbling. Uh, and then I'd say managed cloud Kubernetes is funny. I'm seeing lots of people are popping up on that one. That's genuinely the hot spot that we go to because we're just like, hey, it's kind of handled for us. And we get that sensation, but that's it's kind of just moving the, the veneer of management that there's still all of these other network boundaries, all of these other paths to other things like writing logs, moving data around, moving as we deploy applications to different clouds, right? Where's the back end that's written into code that we may have not only cost, but secure policies. Like if I'm if I'm moving data across a public internet, you know, am I actually encapsulating this in TLS? Am I doing the right things? And only observability of the actual behavior of the traffic can can tell you where that's it. So good, we got lots of good good response there. So I'm seeing definitely uh, managed Kubernetes winning the uh, winning the battle and and hybrid uh, very very cool. So thank you for the folks that are that are doing that. A couple of people that are in the no camp. All right, proud to be IaaS to the finish. I like that. So I'm team private cloud myself. So let's talk about the next thing, right? So if we've got visibility. And then now we've got insight. So we're being able to drive decisions, right? Do I add a new policy? Do I move an application? Do I recode something so that I get rid of a poor behavior? And ideally, we say, hey, all of a sudden, all of this data is moving to the wrong section of the, of the cloud. And then you look, and it's because, hey, there's something wrong. And now, can I either trigger a team to do something or do I actually have some automation? And that's kind of like the more advanced, the deep end of the pool, right? Where I see a behavior has occurred. I either, you know, shut down an application or I respawned it on a different cloud. Now, this is, this is the human side of it. We generally have to first, you know, notify me. So tell Eric and his day two operations team, something went weird. And so I'm going to go in and I'm going to do something. But that can't be the final way in which we deal with it. Because if I do that, then at four in the morning, if that happens again, it's still my fault. So that's where the automation comes in. And I can't do automation if I don't trust the insights. And this is why like, if I don't do the first two steps right, you can't initiate automation. So when I look at this, how do I maintain this desired state based on observability? Because it's a very human behavior, right? It's I've got one application that's coming in and it says it's 25 milliseconds endpoint response time. Great. I've got another one that says it's 14 and it's considered a critical outage because it's a synchronous data application. So it needs to be sub 10 millisecond. There's That's a very human understanding of the application behavior. And this where it comes in, Hasham, let's talk about the developer as the human, right? The app owner and like, they don't necessarily know what's going on in the network. How do we give them that view to help them take action? That's gonna fix their application where they may not have understood what the underlay was. Yeah, I think 
the short answer is teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> uh, so, so, so you're right. So, I, so um, traditionally, application teams and NetOps team, right, managing the network. Uh, it, the work is in in silos, uh, it, and one work depends on the other. Sometimes, um, app work. If it's distributed architecture, it cannot start until the connectivity is provided between the two uh, endpoints, right? Um, and testing cannot begin for the application if uh, the users uh, don't have the connectivity, right? Or uh, the application side, right? Uh, so, uh, so sometimes mostly we see the network uh, becomes the bottleneck, right? Um, and because it is not as automated, as agile, as the apps development, right? Uh, but if your network supports um, the automation, it is um, a network as a code, uh, then it becomes a business enabler, right? Um, and can uh, be agile uh, as your app development is, right? Uh, and it, if rightly so, in uh, like in case of Akira, right? The app development and, and the network, they can be part of the CICD's pipelines. So the interdependencies, uh, they are well taken care of, right? And uh, things are deployed in a timely fashion, right? Um, so I think uh, that's the key point. And when network uh, is agile and simple for the NetOps teams, uh, who are managing the network, uh, it becomes easier to make the decision based on observability, right? Um, whether you make those decisions, those actions um, automated you know, using APIs or just uh, as plain as simple as network design or give uh, power to the NetOps team uh, to manually take actions to uh, have the high availability and high performance of the applications, right? Uh, so in, in, in Akira, you can, uh, Akira makes it so simple, uh, your network that, uh, for example, one example I'll give uh, without getting into too much detail, right? Uh, your DNS architecture in different cloud environments, you may end up having different uh, and DNS services in cloud environments, right? Uh, but if there is a consolidated service, right, um, and your network is taking care of the anycast, uh, then in case of the failures, uh, there is automatic failover, right? The network is observing and it's making the decision on your behalf, right? Uh, so, so you have designed the network uh, and empowering it itself, right? Uh, similar to the services deployed uh, in the network, right? For example, firewall services, uh, do they have the capacity or the ability to auto scale uh, and take care of the extra load or, or downgrade to save the uh, cost of the network, right? Um, and I think one of the example I can think of from uh, the manual action is, uh, we have seen in, in cloud environments uh, that, I mean, issues happen, right? There have been performance degradations, uh, connectivity issues in a certain uh, cloud provider environment in a certain region, even though there is uh, availability, high availability, different availability zones, fault tolerance built in the region, but sometimes your application environments, VPCs or VNets, they might be fine. It's just the path going to those resources. It's uh, it's not effective, right? So observability gives you that data synthetics, give you that information that something is wrong and you need to take action to restore the services. Right? Um, so the network should be capable of having a strong DR strategy, uh, having a manual or decisive uh, ability to take actions uh, to fail over to different regions at will, right? And you should have the power to do that. 
Yeah, that's the uh, you know, show me your show me five nines and I'll show you zero point zero 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 one that's gonna wipe out your five nines. Like there's as as limited as that opportunity is for outage, it's still a failure to me. We still have to, and if you don't have that observability, if you don't have the ability to look at it as a grand picture, then how can you possibly architect for failure? And especially like cloud side outages, they happen. And people say like, oh, but they've got, you know, five, nine, you know, guarantees in their SLA. An SLA just means that they won't charge you for that hour that it went down. That's what an SLA is. Like read the terms of service. It's not that they're like, you know, oh, that's it. You know, we will never let it go down. It will go down. And likely it will, what's even funnier, I'm going to, you know, take the AWS example that happened last year, I believe, where their S3 went down in US East 1 you know, because the default location that everybody puts their stuff in, but their status dashboards were run using S3 as the backing to it. So no one could get at the status dashboards to see that all the services were down. And then this created a problem. Meanwhile, other platforms, and like this is sort of the, the Kentic piece, which I really dig in what you're doing. Like, how do we see what the status of the world is, not just my application. Like how do we infuse that into my awareness of the environment, but also like how do cloud ops and network op teams come together where they can go to like a common place and see this. And it was funny, actually, it's a great question that came from Deepak. Uh, So I'm loading questions on you, Ted, here that's going to come up, but how do we get from application visibility, east west flows in the cloud, because that's really what it matters. We're talking about infrastructure. Like I'm an infrastructure kid, I'm team underlay. But when it really comes down to it, it's about the application. And that application behavior is why, like the application, people don't care about that. When they say full stack engineer, it means down to the MySQL. But there's a lot of stack below that. <laughs> that's our stack right this is where the rest of the real stack happens so what what does that look like when you try and sort of bring that multi-ops team capability into understanding app behaviors so at large you need to look up at a, a lot of different things um kentic we're partnering with alkira that's why we want to have this conversation with them here today we're also partnering with uh, New Relic and Dynatrace, helping understand what's going on at those application tiers. Um, as I d- have described, uh, APM suites at large, you get down to what you you were just talking about. You know, talking about things that Team Underlay cares about, and that's the bump on the wire underneath. So when you have an APM suite up on top, they'll tell you what that application to application view looks like. But there g- becomes a point where your EC2 or your S3, or your network underneath, your cloud provider, or maybe access through the internet to your cloud provider is what's giving you a headache. We had uh, an issue where a bunch of of users uh, back in a previous life out of Chicago were having problems. They're making a bunch of calls coming in, but New York and California weren't having problems. So then it starts to become, is it a regional issue that I need to go fix for a local provider? And maybe I can swing that traffic in a different direction to help that subset of customers? Or is it a larger issue, like you were calling out S3 went down in AWS and everybody was impacted? So do you have the ability to take and swing all of your customers at that point over to US West? Now you have to work with your application teams to be able to do that. But being able to understand what the path looks like from that perspective of the bump on the wire, team underlay, how does that work out? And this is where I love working with the Alkira team because we're going from the APM side of the world down to that overlay where you can make thoughtful insights, thoughtful observability, and then be able to make a change. Either do that manually, see, hey, AWS isn't really identifying that they've gone offline. But I noticed from my APM suite, I noticed from Kentic that we see something is not right in US East how can I move my traffic quickly and easily? Hashem is going to help me do that. Be able to move that to someplace useful. So that's where Kentic is doing the synthetics. When we get into a little bit of the demo here, we have some things, SaaS application monitoring. We're just checking applications. What does that look like on top of everything else? What do the public clouds look like? We got a whole nother tab that we just throw this stuff out there for all of our customers to ingest out of the box. 
what do all of these things look like before we even look at what those customers are doing? And then I, we, we had a conversation about DNS. What does DNS look like around the world? So we've got three tabs in product with our state of the internet, helping understand what the larger world looks like, certain sliced views of each cloud provider. And then as we move along, my hope is to get uh, Hashem and the Alkira, we have that section on the public clouds, build them in and just extend our visibility and capabilities. We have some large backbone providers that grab data out of Kentic and go dump it into their own dashboards, helping understand what that backbone looks like. So it's kind of an all of the above from Kentic, tying together these different views from that application tier through the bump on the wire that the, you know, the team underlay, what Kentic has done for, for years, coming close to a decade or coming up on a decade, over to how do you make that easy to manage all of that infrastructure underneath with the Alkiras of the world. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea that we've got programmability at the, all the network layers, especially with cloud. And you know, now with Kubernetes, of course, the same thing is that there's much more, like it's built from the API outwards. Uh, however, in the end, today what most teams are doing they go to is it down or just me.com like that's like they the number the number one monitoring tool for the cloud is is twitter like just like people will go and they'll just check trending topics like yeah is 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 something going on with zoom you know and and all of a sudden you realize that it's it's not just me it's doing it. but to have that proactive view of here's the broad set of SaaS services are the most common ones that are potentially affecting it and you're sitting there saying to yourself, there's no way it's DNS. There's no way it's DNS. It, it, it was DN- DNS. And it's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we've seen it time and time again, you know, like, oh, did anything change? No, 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 no. There's been no production changes, no app changes, no nothing. Yeah, and I mean, well, I mean, we spent the weekend putting in a spanning tree implementation and, and adding two new BGP ASs, but um, yeah, no, no, no changes. And you're like, I, I think I think there's been a change, right? So how does the application team possibly know what's going on there and, and having, again, that end-to-end observability where the full stack actually goes from the application heuristically and behaviorally down to team underlay and having multiple, like where you two come together. That's why I love the, the pairing this sort of like the, to overquote the you know, one plus one equals three, right? Like where I can take two, observability and policy driven platforms like i say like this is acceptable behavior for this application it's it's cool but this one over here the moment that we hit nine milliseconds i need to know so that i can take action whether that's human or or automated action um and it's funny crossing teams right actually i'm going to pop up a second poll here because we love our polls in this town what what does the team crossover look like because we have devops was a thing, right? Then there was DevSecOps because we forgot to invite the security team to the to the table. Then we have NetSecOps, DevNetOps, like DevNetSecOps. I actually have a thing, it's I call it DevOps-ish full stackedness. It's this concept of like I'm a little bit DevOps-ish, I'm kind of agile. We end up in these battles over like, are you agile enough? But really what it is is like how do we collaborate between teams? So how do you collaborate amongst your teams? Do your are, are we siloed? And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just kind of, it's organizational and human behavior. Uh, you know, and is this, a, like I said, the pop, the hot one comes up, right? When problems happen, everyone gets rapidly collaborative. And maybe that's just kind of how it's going to be. Like, we don't need to invite the developers to the network design team meeting. And we don't invite the cloud finance team to the application sprints for what we're doing. But if we can then bring them together in platforms with a common viewpoint to the data that matters to them to generate the insights that they need, I think we're kind of in that win situation. So, uh, I mean, I love it. You know, I love this idea that we can use common platforms to bring teams together. And Hasham, you know, we talked about that insight of like going from insight to policy as well right so where i could take a human thing and i say like this is 
I'm going to do this. But then quite often policies are written in a wiki. And as my the founder of my last company used to call it, wiki stands for where information kills itself. Like it just basically goes there and it says last updated, you know, two years ago, and it's a policy. But then how do I look at policy that's live in a real environment and understand that, hey, there's a behavior that's going on that's either violating a policy or maybe I can create a policy for, because maybe it's actually kind of cool. Yeah, so... Um... And we got good results there. Yeah, occasional collaboration and only when issue occurs. We're not alone. This is how the world works. I, I love the honesty of the of the people here. This is fantastic. So thank you for the folks that, that gave a, a response in the poll there. So sorry, Hasham, go ahead. Yeah, so I think the um, uh, looking at the network, right? Um, it, it's difficult to cover all aspects uh, and policies do get expired, right? It's, if it's a document. But um, if you have built a simpler network with um, great observability, uh, you would know your SLAs because the system would tell you that something is wrong, right? Um, whether it's in a way of uh, alerts or um, red color popping up at, at different uh, areas of your UI topology, right? Uh, you would know things are not right and, and you would react to it, right? Um, so uh, I think, again, your network needs to have better integration of uh, the visibility and like Ted said, end-to-end um, -end observability, not just the network visibility, but you need to have the end-to-end -end visibility so you look through the network as well. Well, I think this is probably the one I'm going to, I'm the guy that lo always loves to say, let's let's see what it actually looks like, because I think the we we talk about this idea of flow and going from ten tabs down to to three or even hopefully to one. Maybe Hasham, I, if you don't mind, I'd love to actually kind of see see it in action. And Ted, we're going to do the same thing because I want to see I want to see Kentic in action. This is really what what matters. And uh, a, a great question as well. It came in um, from Ahmad in the in the chat of yeah. Do, what does it look like? You know, and I think this is the when we think like, what does it look like to see issues in platforms? And because the problem we often get is that we show an issue in the cloud tab and it says like, hey, there's a problem where the security group is restricting flow from one application to another. But there's no, like the language of my network team does not work in have you gone to the VPC, then to the EC2, then to the security groups? Like, they don't see that. So uh, it, maybe let's let's jump in and, and let's see some some demo goodness here, if you don't mind, Hasham, and we'll uh, we'll get you to share. And yeah. if anybody else has any questions too, let's let this the hot seat is is upon us here. We're going to put Hasham and uh, and Ted on the spot. So let's ask questions while while we roll here. <laughs> yeah, before live before demos are always appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Before I give into uh, the UI and uh, show the Alkira, uh, let me tell a quick story, very quickly to set the base. I mean, we've been discussing this all uh, throughout the webinar, right? So uh, I want to give you a story where imagine you're having a cup of coffee and you're managing your traditional network, right? Um, and for a lot of customers, uh, management comes and then uh, mandates the moving of the application to the cloud. And they give you a number of months to do that task too. But as you do the implementation, um, prepare, plan, design, right? You realize there are a lot of uh, variables, uh, requirements, and, and that needs to be taken care of. And a few months quickly, change into several months into several uh, could take up to a year i've personally seen that's happening uh, in the customer environment right and, and these are the basic requirements uh, on top of it there are several business needs that drive you like um, application distributed architecture 
that you end up in multiple data centers and you are technically uh, operating in small uh, silos data centers with distributed services, right? Um, and on top of it, the use cases that business needs to implement, uh, the, there's a long list of those requirements, right? So, so you have to have a simpler way uh, where you your cloud area networking is simplified. You're not dependent on the agent, so you're reducing your footprint uh, or keeping the same footprint as you already have. There are no physical strings attached to the hardware. So your, your platform is ready to use and it supports the uh, CI, CD integrations uh, and network as a service, right? So the answer is Alkira. Alkira basically takes you from your traditional network, uh, uh, multi-cloud networking to a single pane of glass UI, right? Now, let me quickly show you what this looks like, right? So this is, uh, imagine this is your Alkira tenant. Uh, it is born in cloud, it is deployed in cloud, right? What you see is uh, your Alkira tenant in a browser, right? Uh, these dots, these are the cloud exchange points, which can be deployed in different cloud regions uh, close to your locations. So you have better performances, right? And each of these CXPs, they have different connectivity options within that. If I go into it, go to network tab over here. These are the current CXP deployed in the different regions. Uh, I'll zoom in to US West. Uh, this is the CXP that is deployed in the AWS environment. Uh, and on the left side, you see how you can connect your data centers, your sites, uh, your branches to the CXP, right? So you have, uh, if you have more workload in the AWS, you would want to have your CXP deployed in AWS and you can use AWS Direct Connect to have your data center connect into the uh, CXP. If uh, in case you have more workloads in Azure and your preference is to deploy CXP in Azure, you can use uh, Azure Express Cloud, right? So you can use uh, IPsec or SD-WAN for your site connectivity, right? On the right side, you have different cloud connectors to onboard your cloud resources into Alkira. You can use Azure, GCP, or AWS or OCI cloud connectors, right? In addition, you can also within from the CXP, you can give uh, internet exit to uh, your resources, whether they're on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, once you have this deployed, right? Um, your use cases may require security. So Alkira has a, a robust uh, availability of the third-party services. A security service that can be deployed within the CXP. So it's consolidating uh, your network and you're not operating in silos, right? Uh, but it, it, that's good. But what about the visibility, right? Uh, if we look at each of the connector, right? Akira gives you the monitoring capability. It, it tells you the status, right? And, and what uh, um, Eric was mentioning, the how does the policy or wiki pages policy is defined, right? Uh, they get old. So Alkira alerts you when things go down, right? If the IPC connectivity uh, to the side is going down, uh, it will alert you, right? It'll pop up into red or yellow color, depending on how, uh, what's the nature of the issue. Same thing for the uh, cloud connector side, right? Your VPC st connectivity status are given, right? You can, deep dive, narrow down into more of that. Uh, it, it's it's very difficult to do that in the cloud environment or it's more complex. Alkira makes it very simple looking into what routes you're learning from the cloud uh, environment, your VPC, then what routes you're sending to your network environment. And this is just not on the VPC level or VNet level. You can do it for your whole network. There are four different uh, CXP regions there with multiple uh, sites connected. You can visualize the whole, all your cloud area networking routes through single visualization point, right? And it, it, and it makes the observability, it, 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 it adds a lot more 
to it just showing you the visibility, right? In case there are overlapping IP addresses, which is common in cloud, because you can deploy different VPCs with the same uh, uh, routing ciders, uh, or you have site connectivity uh, or mergers where the same subnets are being used. Alkira prompts you with the overlapping IP addresses, right? Um, uh, in case of there is issue, right? Alkira gives you the visibility and diagnostic tools into uh, uh, to help you troubleshoot the issues. So if I double click on this VPCs, right? These are the networking uh, troubleshooting tool that you can have. Uh, gives you the health uh, of uh, the connector, how you're connecting to it in case of an issue. You can deep dive into the logs of your IPsec and BGP connectivity, right? You don't have to jump to different windows to do that. You can ping, you can trace route to certain endpoints. You can do packet capture. Packet capture can be done, and then you can download a PDF file, uh, um, PCAP file or text file, or you can have a live view or flow uh, through the same UI of uh, what is traffic going to that cloud connector right, and what is coming from that uh, connector, right? Uh, so it's really powerful. Packet capture, looking at the flows in the cloud, it's it's very complex in uh, in the network, right? And, and uh, one point I want to mention is uh, Alkira provides multiple layers of policies, right? So you can have policies defined to control how you're moving the traffic, right? And uh, based on that, you can identify uh, what flows are there. So that adds to your observability, right? Um, and I think last thing that I want to touch base is we talked about, uh, when we talk about the insight, you, uh, the first step is to have a complete understanding of what your cloud layout is. So Alkira integrates cloud insights uh, and gives you a complete footprint of your environment uh, or what resources you're deployed with. Right? Um, you can narrow it down to a single VPC and uh, go to a, a specific security group to identify what things are defined. Um, so this is what the network observability is, right? But I think uh, personally, uh, I've worked with Kentic uh, and I've seen how the Kentic brings the value uh, of observability and end-to-end -end monitoring. I've tested uh, and used Kentic for uh, from data center to the cloud resources, from cloud to cloud within same region or multi-region environment. Uh, and for the uh, health and availability of the SaaS applications as well, right? I, I think Ted will definitely go deep dive into it, right? So just yeah, to that's actually uh, that's really ideal because we, if we think of the the pairing, I mean, see, you had me at agentless and integrated troubleshooting because we talked about that action, like to, in order to. Like most people, they think of the decision and action portion of that OODA loop, like observe, orient, decide, act. Act is you go sifting through your desk drawer looking for the nine pin serial cable to plug into your 6509. Like that's that was network troubleshooting for the longest time, right? Understanding like in the CLI going to X terms and like just this idea that you can have this, I, I can honestly say there's two types of people in the world, those that are going to ask for a demo of Alkira and those that don't care about their production network. Like that's, if you look at running this and now like, so Ted, let's talk about the Kentic pairing. Cause I love the fact that you both have significantly different offerings, but like that tie-in is super cool. So we were at a, a trade show together and um, I was walking through the other vendor booths. So we started this conversation with the Alkira team. I said, wouldn't it be great if we could add that Alkira view visibility of the different clouds together with what we're doing with Kentic? And so we have this state of the internet here. So just some basic applications that a lot of people need, a lot of people are relying on, um, can you know, sort over here, ADP, blue jeans, box, stuff like that. 
Um, but what's more interesting is kind of what's going on with status codes. What do those applications look like? This is a, more of an application type view, but we pair that together with over here on the right hand side, we've got the, the standard network type views. A lot of that stuff that the Alcura team was showing, we're looking at that latency, that packet loss and jitter, what that looks like underneath. And so Kentic is, uh, comes from a backbone view of the world. Global providers, telephone companies, cell phone companies are using us to understand uh, what things look like. And as we move through and become uh, more adept at managing all of those provider needs, we have uh, the cloud scale companies that came and said, hey, this is cool. You can do this at scale. Doing all of this data ingest and tying together not only these network components over here, but that HTTP latency, the response time, the DNS lookup time, making all of this available, we were able to go from that backbone provider type view into the cloud and start to understand for those cloud providers. So here's an application slice. Um, as we move on, this public cloud here, we're looking at providing that same visibility, that packet loss latency and jitter of what's going on in your cloud provider helping understand, is it me and my application or is it the provider footprint? And this is where I get excited with, with Alkira. You could choose to move your traffic from one region to another region because you see something has gone wrong. I would love to see uh, the Alkira overlay of what each of these providers and over here, you know, Digital Ocean or GCP, I would just have Alkira here and add on what's the Alcura effect of being able to push and move things around. So here's something that we are doing out of the box, helping all of our customers understand before they even deploy anything, what does the footprint out there look like from an application perspective? What does the footprint of the real world look like from a cloud provider perspective? And then uh, quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll go over here, doing this again from DNS, because these are common technologies that everybody uses. And if you can deploy in your network and start to understand what your footprint looks like and deploy some of the Kentic synthetics on top of whatever applications you need, whatever your cloud footprint looks like, we built this compare and contrast. Am I getting good results? Is it a section of the internet? Is it a section of the cloud that has gone down that's causing me a headache? Can I quickly identify that with the Kentic state of the internet and then compare and contrast that? How many of my applications? How many of my customers, how many of my staff members have been impacted by this? The cool thing is uh, we we're just at KubeCon and at KubeCon, we announced uh, a beta helping go in just a little bit deeper. So instead of just looking at the cloud provider or the internet, we're now able to take that same view of the network and start to see, hey, I've got an entry point over here. Here's my load generator. I'm gonna come in and here's a product catalog. Here's a recommendation service. Here's a cart service. So within Kubernetes, when you deploy, let me scroll down just a touch, we're down here deploying on nodes, but what we want to bubble up is up here, the services and understanding for those services, what that traffic flow looks like. This is what Kentic does for the large internet cell phone companies for that cloud deployment. Now we're able to show volumetrically what traffic is going on in your Kubernetes cloud, what's going on in that node. We can see those containers that are running and what that performance looks like. We're able to tie all of these things together from that smallest component of say the pods and services within Kubernetes all the way back across that cloud uh, infrastructure where you're running your Kubernetes or in your data center. And what that looks like across the larger picture of the internet. And we're relying on partners like Alkira to help shift that traffic. We have um, the visibility, uh, the observability with the APM suites. We have uh, Cloudflare partnerships so that as we see these things, we can fire off, hey, we see something to Alkira and say, it put a human in the loop and execute a mitigation. So it goes up and you get a on call. But most of our customers after 90 days, they pull the human out of the loop. We've re mediated and mitigated so many things so often accurately that they 
go fix it and then tell us what got fixed so that we can go look at it and make sure everything is still in good shape. And those teams that have a knock, we have these knock views available to show something went wrong and it was able to be mitigated. Now, I love this idea of the view. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put up a, a quick poll here as well. This is the uh, the final poll of the day. I, you trust me on this one. Uh, uh, this Because I know people probably saw this and said, I got deeper questions. They want to see it in action. So if you want, let us know which of the platforms you want to get a personalized demo of, because I think that's the better way to look in and, and ask deeper questions. We wanted to focus on some of the core challenges. And I love this idea of, but like visualizing in the language of the person that's in there. So the, I'll say we call it personas, right? Like if I'm a network operator and I need to understand Kubernetes, but my Kubernetes operator needs to understand the service layer and then tie it to the network. The network team needs to see the network up and then map it to the services so they can talk to the cube ops people. Then you've got that east-west, that total visualization that you showed, Hasham, seeing what it looks like like just to be able to have it in one spot is fantastic in from what I've seen. And the fact that these are agentless is also means like there's literally zero friction to put this in place. It's actually kind of a no-brainer in in my view to try both of the platforms out because then it gives you that like that dynamic view you're gonna see is what has to be there, even if it's completely right. Well, they say like even a broken clock is right twice a day. Well, the same thing is about a network diagram. That and and it's probably not even twice a day that that the network diagram. Good, you know, good on you for for being a Vizio jockey. And and you've got this day in the life diagram on the wall behind you that shows your BGP AS zones. And then there's like a a marker through the one because you had to rename it because you had you know crossover. You've got NAT interfaces buried all over the place. You've got competing IP networks. When you get into that next layer now, and you've got layer four to seven connectivity to the services inside Kubernetes, like all bets are off at that point. And this is why you need to have the ability to visualize so that you can troubleshoot. And then to show that we could actually go in the same platforms and troubleshoot. You know, this is... As an operator myself, this is my panacea that I don't need to then go to, you know, 10 different places to take action. I can see what's going on. I can take troubleshooting and preventative action. And then even better, I can influence policy building going forward and actually create policies in the platforms and then also out to the, the different teams. So it's kind of a win-win if you ask me. Um, and for folks, there you go. So a couple more, we'll leave the pull up for a couple more seconds for people that do want to get a, a personalized demo. Cause this, I think is where everybody sees this conceptually and they're like, yep, I feel seen, right? This is a pain that I felt, but being able to go through and, and see it in action. Uh, and I put a couple links in the chat too, while, while you guys were doing the demo, cause I know I've, uh, I've, I've taken a look at some of the solution briefs. So there's a couple of links there. I urge people to take a look at that. And I know we're up to the hour. I just, sorry, I couldn't help but like let everybody run through that full view of it because I was I was too excited. So thank you, first of all, everybody for joining us. This has been fantastic. Thank you to Hasham uh, and the entire Alkira team. Thank you to Ted and the entire Kentic team for hosting this. Thank you to all the YouTubers and, and live LinkedIn live viewers and the Twitter, I don't know if it's Periscope or whatever they call the Twitter live, whatever Twitter's video streaming is, is these days for folks that are watching. I'm seeing some, some comments coming up over there as well. So hi, Steve, starts my friend, uh, I, somebody, a familiar face I recently saw at uh, SNIA SDC. We're in person again too. Where are you? Where are you folks going to be next? Let's talk about events that are coming up. You talked about KubeCon, uh, Ted, uh, Hasham. Have you guys got upcoming events there? We've got that little thing that's going on in Las Vegas in a couple of weeks. Uh, anybody going to be? Obviously, if you're a cloud person, you're aware that reInvent's coming up. We're going to see some folks that are going to be on the ground there. Um, and of course, if people want to connect with you directly. What's the best way in which they can do that? Hasham, let's start with you. Yeah, um, definitely visit 
uh, .com, request a demo. We would love to talk to you and understand your um, use cases and how we can help you out. Yeah. And I think the one thing as well to add to this is that the ability for us to feedback to these teams, the one thing I've really enjoyed and why we're here, right? I, I loved coming on to work with these two fantastic teams because they listen so well they don't they have no one has told me how the industry works they asked how do i run my environment and how can they help so as a as a customer of any company that's the best approach so uh you know hats off uh, chapeau as they would say uh, en france uh that this is the most important thing about being working with a partner and then the way that your teams work together is fantastic so ted Obviously, Kentic.com, uh, people are even watching us and we registered for a lot of the webinars here. Where do we find you and, and your, the Kentic team uh, to connect? So we're going to be at AWS reInvent upcoming. Um, I'm Ted Turner. So I'm linkedin.com slash in Ted Turner. That's me on LinkedIn. I'm also Ted Turner in Cal. Uh, back when I was living in California, that was the name I chose. And it's not necessarily accurate anymore, but I'll, I'll maintain the name. <laughs> Exactly. And for safety, we won't reveal your current location. It's uh, somewhere in a uh, in a beautiful uh, wooded location, uh, hidden from, from view. So, and on the network, this is it, right? We can, I saw the Zoom was in there. Zoom was showing good. We got good response time. We had no jitter. This was fantastic. So for folks, thank you again to all the folks that were on the webinar. Uh, do check out, hit those solution briefs. Uh, looking forward to, to people getting demos. I'm excited on the behalf of, of folks. Uh, again, my name is Eric Wright. We are here provided by the, the team at Kentuck and Alcure. Thank you all for spending the time with us today. And Jordan, thank you for, for DJing this whole thing in the back uh, and, and making this come together with that. We'll say goodbye and good luck, and we'll see you all at AWS reInvent in a couple of weeks.